Good morning, brothers and sisters. This morning, uh, my words are based on uh, a verse found in Matthew 26. Um, And it's found in uh, the 39th verse. And I think it's uh, quite eye-opening, really, when we read it. I'll give you a minute to look that up. Matthew 26, verse 39 says, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now we're all very familiar with these words. Uh, They are words we've heard many, many times. These words are obviously uh, those of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we recognize them as some of his very last words. In fact, they are one of his final prayers that he spoke to God as he prepared for his death of crucifixion. Now in the past, we have heard exhortations that have instructed us to begin with the end in mind. I believe Brother Ed has quoted that concept many times. And now right here in front of us is an example of that. If we are to begin our spiritual lives with the end in mind, then let's look closely at this example. Here in Matthew chapter 26, Christ was preparing for his death, the end. And at that point, he was able to say, not my will or pardon me, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now this is uh, spiritual maturity. Christ demonstrates where he was and where we need to be by the end of our lives. Not as I will, but as thou wilt. Christ made his will of the flesh give way or submit to the will of God. When we start out as a child, we begin to develop our own will. And from birth till approximately age two, we refine that will until it spews forth and manifests itself in raw human flesh. It becomes evident that my will, or the human will, fleshly will is the thing that each and every one of us want to cater to even if we don't fully understand why just as a child of two years old may not understand we want need and love to do what we want to do and we hate anyone trying to stop us that's called raw human nature in a toddler, we can see it very very clearly because co- toddlers don't know enough to hide it. We wouldn't think of lying on the floor and having a temper tantrum because it's too blatantly obvious we're trying to get our own way. As mature adults trying to get our own way, we are much smoother. We have simply refined and honed our skills but we're still serving our own will, unless we have had some intervention to teach us a better way. Now what's interesting about reading this verse in Matthew chapter 26 is that we are given the benefit of hindsight, in a sense, through the eyes of Christ. We are told that Christ, uh, pardon me, we are not told that Christ ever specifically had the early childhood problems that the rest of us had. It doesn't say anywhere that he had tantrums or fights with his parents or siblings, but we know that he had the same impulses and the same weaknesses that you and I have. But here in Matthew, we read about Christ who has made it through his life to the end and demonstrates to us a complete and fully submissive character. The child who conquered every tendency to serve himself 
in favor of serving his father Yahweh. O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. There's the goal. From birth to death, a serving of self or doing what we want to do to the other end of the spectrum where we glorify God and do what he wants us to without any complaining, grumbling, or any assertion of self-will. Not as I will, but as thou wilt. How many of us could say that? It starts as a child learning to respect and obey parents and elders, authority, respect for property, and others. Parents teach their children these things. Where did the parents learn that from? Well, probably they learned it from their parents or teachers. And where did that all begin from? Well, if we really dig deep enough, I think we'll find it came from the influence of God and God's Word. Now, we all remember the verses found in John chapter 1, verse 1. It said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God's Word is what has influenced us and our parents and their parents, and so on, and so on, and so on. Any good that we see came from the influence of God. In other words, if you see good in a person, thank God, because it didn't happen through natural osmosis. God's word, his principles, his influence has affected us, or our ancestors, enough to make them teach us. Even the people around us that don't go to church and don't even read their Bible, but seem to be good people, who taught them? Was it their parents or a Christian society that they grew up in, all of which God had some effect on? We all remember when school began every day years ago with the Lord's Prayer. And lunch never started without prayer by all the children in that school. Did society have the truth? The answer would be no. But God influenced the former generations so that even if they didn't have a clue who Abraham was, they knew how to be respectful. They know how to be courteous, honest, and trustworthy. The former generations were raised by a society that had a considerable influence from Christian religion. One poll taken in 1949 stated that 49% of people attended church in the past seven days. Five years ago, only 20% attended church in Canada, and I highly doubt that meant every Sunday. That influence can be seen by simply comparing the moral integrity of the senior citizens of our time with the younger generation that is about to come into the workforce. Why is there such a difference? Scripture says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What way is that, that the child should go? It is interesting, if you look in Genesis chapter 18, and we pick up a clue there as to what way that might be. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. We read a comment made by God concerning Abraham. God says, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, or after God, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, 
that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. That way is God's truth. It is what will influence each of us to strive to do better. It will help us to say within ourselves, not as I will, but as thou wilt. God's way will help us to conquer our tendencies to do what we want and submit to doing what God wants. The simplest way to define what God's way is, is by recognizing that there really is only two ways. And they are God's will, or God's way, and our will, or our way. So Christ stated at his death, at the end of his life, a very important principle that he had learned very, very well. Not as I will, but as thou wilt. Our job here right now is to become very familiar with what his will is, so that we can honor him by showing respect for him and glorifying his name by submitting, as Christ is showing us, to his or God's will. There are times when we try so hard to honor him or glorify him by being perfect. We always do our readings, or we always say our prayers, or we always get to class, or we always get to meeting, and then we fail. We do something, or we say something, or we don't say enough, whatever the case may be, we feel like we failed. We have not done his will. Christ shows us, however, that there is much more to glorifying God than just not doing wrong. It is true we must strive to avoid sin and evil, but when we do sin or dishonor God by doing evil, we must understand we can take steps to rectify or resolve that evil by condemning it. Our job is to love righteousness and hate evil. Both of these glorify God. Christ demonstrated this principle to us. All through his life, Christ lived God's way. He tried and succeeded to honor God by doing God's will. What's interesting is that he never failed like we do. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So how could Christ show us an example of condemning sin within himself and in turn glorify or honor his Father? Well, he did this by condemning the nature that he had within himself. <clears throat> He condemned his human will, his fleshly thoughts, and that inner desire which opposed his father. And he did this by willingly taking that aspect of sin to the cross and condemning it. And by doing this, he glorified his father, just as he had glorified his father in doing righteous acts throughout his whole life. It amounts to this. We can glorify or honor God by doing righteously, but if we fail, all is not lost. We can repent and denounce the sin we've made, restoring the honor to God's name that was lost through our sin. Christ was not only obedient by never sinning, transgressing, or committing iniquity, but he took it one step further by condemning the very nature he had, which he had inherited from his father Adam. It wasn't his fault he had human nature, but his whole goal on earth was to glorify God, his father, who he dearly loved. His whole mission was to exalt God. To show to the earth how pure and righteous and wonderful God is. 
Christ didn't have a checklist which he went through and said, well, I didn't sin here or here or here or here. I believe he looked for ways to magnify God and honor him and ways to extol him. Every time time Jesus opened his mouth, I don't believe he was worried about saying something wrong. I think he was trying to say something right and to do righteously. When we're at work or school, do we try to give honor to God by making our tongues and words testify to the fact that we love God? Can others around us tell by our words that we are servants of God? Is it because we don't swear or we take, don't take the Lord's name in vain that people know we are sons of God? Or is it a combination of that and honoring him when we pray to thank God for our lunch? Or talking to others about our belief in God, showing people through our dealings and work ethic that we are not here serving ourselves. There is a saying that goes something like this. If we were convicted of being a lover or worshiper of God, would there be enough evidence for a conviction? We cannot go through life simply striving not to do things wrong. Although that is important, we must also try to go through life taking every opportunity to do things right, to honor our Father by every word that comes out of our mouth, and by every opportunity that presents itself. God wants to see our demonstration to Him of how we love Him, and that we honor Him, so that He can say to us one day, as it says in Matthew 25 and 21, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. This isn't a matter of never doing anything wrong or ever making mistakes. We all make mistakes. We all rebel at times against God's way, and we all pervert or twist God's God's way on occasion. The point is that we always try to do those things which are do, which do nothing to hurt God's reputation. And if we do hurt God's reputation by our words or our actions, then we need to take steps to restore God's honor by taking responsibility for our deeds. Condemning sin and righting the wrong done against God's name. In this way, we glorify the Father, just as Christ glorified the Father by crucifying his sin nature, his inner desire to do his will, his own will, instead of God's, on the cross. Why? Because it was directly opposed to his Father, and it was only by Christ's continual fight against that nature that kept him from allowing his nature to manifest or demonstrate itself. Christ conquered the temptation to sin all through his life, and then he took the source, the nature itself, and condemned it by crucifying it on the cross. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, it says, For it pleased the Father that in him, or Christ, should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Why did it please the Father? Was it not because Christ condemned sin? He witnessed against sin. Was it not because Christ honored God and stood up to support his Father by declaring he is right? We, brethren and sisters, can do the same when we fail. The identification of our failings, the acceptance that it was wrong and hurt God's reputation, that it marred his glory is what we need to recognize. It's not about us saving face 
or about us trying to uphold our reputation. It's about honoring God and upholding his reputation. Think about how many people in history, in the history of this world have hurt God's reputation. How many people today hate religion or religious people because others have marred God's reputation? How many of those people that hurt God's reputation could have restored others' faith in God and religion if they had simply admitted their fault, admitted their mistakes, and condemned their own actions and cleared God of any guilt? Do we take responsibility for our own sins? When we make a mistake, do we have the integrity to admit our mistakes? When people look at us, do they have a good feeling about believers in God? Or do we represent something that others never want to be? Can We can honor our Father by doing right. But when we do wrong... We can still honor him by taking responsibility for those actions and condemn sin for what it is. Sin is anything that mars God's glory. This is our test. Do our words and actions in any way hurt God's reputation or his glory? As we are about to take this bread and wine, let's examine ourselves and ask the question, When people in the world observe us, can they tell I'm here serving God and honoring Him? Or do they look at us and see someone serving and honoring ourselves, justifying self or justifying God? Is there any way we could improve the way we speak or the way we treat others in business, the way we act at work? or the way we act in our communities, or wherever we go throughout our week? Are we striving to enhance God's reputation through our words and actions? Or, pardon me, are we glorifying His name in our communities? May we all work together in an effort to honor our Father and to lose ourselves and exalt God. In the world, the saying goes, Take one for the team. What can we do this week that can glorify God by putting his reputation ahead of ourselves?